think that's everything covered. So um, uh, let's get on with it. I'd like to introduce um, all three guests. So um, uh, I'll start with Beth because I, I was only introduced to Beth by Will um, uh, last week, uh, but I was so inspired by this by the uh, not only the job that she's doing. She's a she's a proper teacher. She's in at the sharp end in in, a, in what is one of the poorest socially economically challenged areas in the country. Um, uh, and she's a classroom teacher in Senko as well, but it's the fact that it's the passion with which she spoke and the ideas that she had about how education should be. So I'm, I'm really pleased to, that she's come along for this and, and um, she's able to sort of contribute to the conversation. Um, she came into this conversation as a result of Will Ryan. Will's been an associate for quite a while with independent thinking. The background as, as a teacher, head teacher in various schools, senior advisor, working again in areas in the north of England that have had their challenges over the years and still do and I know how passionate he is about about community and I'll come back to him on that and then Dave Harris Dave's been an associate for quite a while back when he was a, a head teacher who brought together a junior school an infant school junior school and a secondary school in a, in a former mining village in north um, uh, Nottinghamshire and transformed that school into an all through school and one of the reasons being to get transition right. He wrote for us recently the, the, the book Independent Thinking on Transition. I know he's passionate about getting that right and has ideas around there. And there are so many questions that people have about transition into school, between schools, with all that's going on um, uh, currently. Let me start. So that's our panel and welcome. And let me start with Will. Community. Will, what is the impact of focusing on community? in poorer socioeconomic in, uh, environments anyway, regardless of COVID. Talk to us about community. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about community. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody, where, wherever you may be as well. Uh, and an, I think an interesting point about transition is also people often see transition as being between key stages or between primary school and secondary school. There is also this bit about transition from community into education as well, which I, I, I think is, is highly significant. Uh, and we're going to talk to Beth later, working in a challenging community, a community where it hits so many of the multiple deprivation indexes, whether it's about health deprivation, economic deprivation, employment deprivation, education deprivation, crime deprivation. Uh, and, 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 and there is this thing uh, about transition from community to school, quite definitely. Uh, and I think that is, is, is a key bit. I found myself going back uh, in my thinking to something that happened about the year 2000, Ian, at a stage when I was working with Rothenborough Council uh, and the DfE at that stage hit upon this wonderful idea which they called Excellence in Cities. And they launched this project in, for vulnerable communities. Um, and uh, they described it, and this is very un-DFE by the way, as a voyage of discovery with a few shipwrecks along the way, uh, which is quite, quite an unusual uh, DFE term because it's always about standards and targets and hard targets and smart targets uh, and things like that. But they recognised actually in some, in some communities, to use the ITL strap line, we have to find that, that other way. Uh, and as part of that work, um, I, I had to submit a submission uh, and I found myself looking at this issue, which I call pupil inclusion indicators. Uh, and I found myself revisiting it, I suppose, on, on the back of the, the conversation that we're going to have this afternoon. And it's about looking at specific children who you are know are not adapting well to school situations. And we hit upon a series of about 38 questions. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all 38. Uh, about how children ad ad adapt to, to school situations in challenging communities. Uh, and we looked at kind of, we, we came under headings such as vulnerable groups and cultural links, peer and adult relationships, indicators relating to learning and school engagement, indicators relating to self-esteem and emotional security uh, and physical safety. And we, we found ourselves devising a whole load of questions. Does the child belong to a group or groups that achieve well, well in school? Does the child immediately recognise his or her role model? Does the child eff enjoy effective communication with peers? Uh, is the child accepted by the class? And, and a whole list of questions. And when we started to 
look at certain children through those questions, we started to get into this issue about what does the community need. When I'm working with schools on curriculum now, and transition for me is part of curriculum, for me the definition of curriculum relates to all the experience a child receives as they pass through a school. It is not a list of programmes of study. It is far more than that. And when I was training, the hidden curriculum was all significant. It was that children, what, what the children learn incidentally as they pass through the school. And some of it may be positive and, and some of it may be negative. And when I'm working with, with a school on curricular issues, I get them to look at their community. There's two bits that steer it. As educationalists, what do they believe about education? What do the best classrooms look like? Well, how do the best teachers function? What does the best learning look like? But secondly, what is it like growing up on the streets around this school? What do these children come with? Can they build relationships? Can they deal with conflict? Do they come from homes with books? Do they come from homes where learning is valued? What's the faith buildup? What's the cultural buildup? And we use the statistical stuff to get into that as well. But what is it like growing up on the streets around this school? And therefore, what is it that our school curriculum must provide for these children? And that's where things like the pupil inclusion indicators come into it. Now, if anybody out there is interested in the pupil inclusion indicators, I can organise to forward them to Ian or, or to a proper person or, or somebody like that, and, and they can be distributed accordingly. But for me, the curriculum is about the whole experience. But, and Ofsted are saying this. Ofsted are giving a message under what they call the three eyes. And schools should have a clear view on what they intend their curriculum to do, how it will be implemented, and what the impact of that curriculum will be on the school and the community. Now, the sad bit about Ofsted and implementation, they bang on about all the stuff they've been banging on for, for 20 years about subject leadership and equitable delivery and, 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 and measuring progress. But there's nothing in Ofsted's thoughts that are going to make the hairs tingle on the back of a seven year old's neck. And I think that's where the skill of implementation lies. And it's understanding your community devising the curriculum and how you implement it. And despite what Michael Gove might say, children will uh, learn, learn far, more, far more about how, through how the curriculum is delivered than, than, than what is delivered. Right. I don't so, know if that's helpful in any form. Yeah, as somebody's already, I just noticed did come up on the chat that they want your list. So if you uh, get that list to Nina yeah. and we'll just- Yeah, uh, but equally, uh, uh, it, it is in leadership with a moral purpose as well. <laughs> Just need slightly revising because it's a little bit dated, Ian. I, I mentioned it's okay. I mentioned Dave's book. I forgot to mention any of your books, Will, and your books are very, very good. They leadership. Oh, you're purpose. so kind, Ian. Inspirational leaders, inspirational teachers, and more. Um, just just staying on community, and 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 I want to come back to community and the the chapter you wrote, which is a remarkable chapter in our book, the Working Class book, which is a big book with lots of contributors, and how the power of community held Rotherham together in a difficult time, because I think there are things that we can learn there for this current crisis. So I'll come back to that in a minute, but I just want to bring in, uh, I'll, bring, I'll, I'll go to Dave and then I'll, 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 I'll go to Beth. Dave, in your role as teaching in difficult, in, I've got to get the terminology right, I don't know, challenging, challenged, poor areas, social, show, economically disadvantaged areas, all of that, how, how is, how does community impact on what goes on in the classroom? And then as a school leader, bringing the schools together and also then creating new schools as you did in the middle of Nottingham a while back. What is the role of community and in the development of the school? Community is absolutely key. And I, kind of, I suppose I tend to, some people might say oversimplify, but for me, I kind of see most things fairly simply. And I think community is key. You cannot have a successful school unless it's working with the community. I think unless you, I will say to school leaders, you must never be in a position where you are doing to your community. It always must be with. And I think, you know, you, you're struggling to find words that don't offend uh, around community. And I, I think you're right not to avoid offending. Every community I've worked in, and I've worked in some 
great places. I worked, I worked in, in uh, some of the more challenging parts of Hull. I worked in North Nottinghamshire, um, I, and I worked in the centre of Nottingham and all over Nottinghamshire. And I would hate anyone to think that I look down on any of those communities. In fact, quite the opposite. I've got such fondness for those places and the people. What I did need to do was to understand them. And why I very quickly realized that you are a fool if you go into a community taking and thinking your values are the important one. Now, whether you use something like Will's uh, uh, questions or whether you just use something even more basic, which is just, you know, what is it about? And once you let yourself believe what they want and stop thinking what you want, you've got a real opportunity to make a difference. But be really clear, if your community and you do not have the same idea about where you want to go, what, what chance is there for your, your school? The whole point of a school is surely to take, help young people grow and, and develop to be wonderful members of that community. It's absolutely no good if you're producing wonderful members that you think will fit the community. You actually have to be part of producing wonderful young people who are going to be positive contributions to that community in the way that that community wants. And so community is utterly the key of, uh, of everything. And there is no magic button. The main thing is relationships. And I always used to say, if you start with one meeting and you have one person turn up, don't go, oh, well, it's not worth my time. It's worth your time because you spend time getting to know that one person and they will bring in somebody else and then they'll bring in somebody else. And the most successful things I've ever done have been some of the, the lowest key things where you just started talking and you made people realize that you're not looking down your nose. You're not judging them because they may not have as much money as other areas. Actually, you're valuing what they've got and the things they bring. And some of these communities we're talking about are some of the most wonderful, magical places. You know, of course they have problems, but they are incredible. And that's what they need it. They deserve incredible schools and incredible education to help them bring out those talents, which are too often misjudged or hidden away. It, it's in, it's interesting when you talk about the community. The school needs to produce young people who become the adults in the community, because then you get issues around. And this is something um, real David Cameron, one of our associates, who's um, I think there's still spaces left on his. Or oh, there's a Rotterdam's finest going over. You can hear that. Um, uh, he's working, uh, doing a session for us tomorrow around equity and uh, poverty and the idea of social mobility. And if we're not careful, what the, what the school does is produce the people who will leave the community and haven't got what the community needs, but they've got they, it, social mobility is leaving behind and going somewhere better. And we need to unpick that whole idea around, around social mobility. But maybe we'll do that with, with um, David Cameron and Chris Kilkenny tomorrow. Um, Beth, so with, thank you, Dave. With regard to community, what what is your community like, and how how do you interact with your community in your school, and how's your community doing just at the moment? Um, so I, I work in in a school in Rotherham. It's a large school um, on a, a council estate in Rotherham. Um, it was a, an ex mining community. Um, so it is challenging, but I would agree with what Dave said in terms of actually. I wouldn't work anywhere else because that community is a community that I, I've grown to love um, and those relationships and the little quirks that might be the challenges are actually the things that you grow to love and you work with. Um, so I, I was talking quite, and I've thought about it quite a lot in terms of our community and if I go back to our school um, even three, four years ago, um, I think the community were quite disengaged and I think um, parents, families were quite disengaged. We've got a lot of parents who themselves have had bad experiences in school. So automatically, if we want them to come into school, they've got a barrier up and we've worked really hard to kind of get rid of that barrier. How are we gonna, how are we gonna address that? Um, and a lot of that has come down to our relationships um, and actually taking time. I mean, when I have a meeting with families now, um, I will make sure, even though I've got a class of year ones down there as well, um, I'll make them up to 
I know that they have brown sugar and a milk and 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 it's those things because that automatically makes them feel settled and comfortable um so it's your rela relationships with your children and your students absolutely but also those relationships with the families um because once you've got that i think you've got a way in um to kind of get them on board and see what they need and see what they're asking for um I thought, again, thinking about where we are now, um, about our community, I think VA Day um, was quite a kind of turning point for us. Because um, I've seen in, in the community that I work in, all the street parties, playing bingo, um, that sort of thing, all the social distance um, celebrations. And actually, I thought, do you know what? This, this community feels feels together again um, it's felt it's felt very torn apart very negative um, and actually that one day because I was seeing the pictures on social media from staff that work at school that live in the area or whatever um, and actually it felt like it was reconnected and when I've been getting um, the, the, the pictures of the children's learning from, from um, through the emails I've seen again, they're going for walks. They're going for walks around their community. They're sending me pictures of things that they've noticed in their community. And our children did not do that before this. Our children would go, they'd go to the, the shop and get their sweets and then they'd go home and then they'd sit on their computer game. And now I've got children that are suddenly, they can tell me about what they've seen in their community. And I'll be honest, I've tried to get that through my geography lessons and it's worked, but I think they've got so much more out of it this time. Um, so that's kind of led me on to thinking, actually, a bit like what Will said. So we've, we've kind of, I feel like we've found a little bit more of that sense of community. We've come back together. Um, there is that uncertainty about coming back into school because of um, the, the health situation and the, and the fear around that. So what are we going to do? What are we going to give our community? They've come together. How can we carry this on and how can we be part of that? Um, so I was thinking about what, what, what our community needs for our children and how we're going to move the community forward because it's kind of, I think, stayed um, ongoing, doing the same thing. And we, we want to offer the opportunities, um, but I think it's more than that. I think it's about the people that we want to make. Um, and so I wrote kind of a list um, that I feel is important. So I feel that they need to be resilient, articulate, um, have a positive sense of self. And I think that's, a, that's key um, because I think in a lot of um, sort of deprived communities, that's where you find people are quite down on themselves. Um, they don't have that belief that makes them go, no, I can try this, I'll give this a go. Um, the awareness and um, emotional stability. And that, that was quite a, an interesting one. Again, for me as Senko, um, I work with a lot of autistic children, for example. Um, how, how, how am I going to create emotional stability for these children that have suddenly lost school, they've lost um, their learning environment, I've had to take away um, some soft furnishings and things like that. How am I going to create emotional stability from this? Because that's what the community needs. Um, and that's where I've kind of come on to thinking about what I, what I will do when I go back. And that's where um, I was actually listening to Jonathan Lear um, earlier on. And I heard him say that actually he's not worried about catching up. Um, he's, he's not worried about that because he knows his curriculum <laughs> will provide that. And that's where I was thinking, actually, I'm really not worried about catching up. But what I am worried about is creating these, these young people that this community needs. And... So I think our curriculum, because we do follow some of, of Jonathan Lear's um, ideas, I think our curriculum will be fine, but I think now we need to be more careful than ever in interspersing it with the things that our individual community needs. And through the concepts that Jonathan Lear said, I think we can do that and with stories and with talk and with listening and listening to the families as well. Um, I think I think is really important. The, the, um, if anybody doesn't know, so Jonathan Lear was in a conversation, two conversations ago this morning with Mark Creasy, both of them. Jonathan Lear is a teacher in Sheffield, year six teacher. Um, uh, he's written a book, Guerrilla Curriculum, 
uh, the monkey proof, uh, um, monkey -proof, uh, monkey -proof box. Uh, Nina will put the stuff in the in the chat room. Um, uh, um, uh, and yeah, one of the things he was saying, and, and, and this we're seeing from other schools as well through this What Now Week is um, with all the pressure, and we'll come back to the going back stuff later on in this conversation, but this, the playing the catch up, it's, no, there's other things we need to do first before we get them in and race them towards potential SATs or give them extra, you know, work through the holidays. There's, there are other things to get right, but right first, and that's coming through loud and clear, Beth, in your work as well. And, and with the with the special needs angle as well, which is which adds another layer to to how important that, like you said, that emotional stability is, and and, and linking that to the community and listening, and that's what that's what comes through from all three of you, rather than sometimes we can there's a bit of a missionary model of we do do unto these the poor people and the poor communities and we'll rescue them and we'll make it so they can leave and no let's 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 find the stuff that they're doing that's really good and celebrate that in the working class but we keep referring to this there's a whole section i think around confidence and shame and pride and just how we need to work specifically on these things and we can do lots of strategies for developing pride and addressing shame and specifically developing confidence and self-confidence um so let's 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 find out what they need but let's talk to them and engage them linked to that i want to come back to will because in that the working class book Will wrote a, a, a really powerful chapter and it was quite long, it was longer than many of the others, but I wanted to keep it in its entirety because it was him sort of going back into some of the schools in Rotherham that had dealt with some quite awful circumstances, yet were thriving despite all that was going on. And, and what came through was it was the community that held ev everything together. So if, if you just, just briefly sort of explain that situation, that chapter, Will, and then we can sort of what lessons we can draw now for this current crisis. Um, the first thing to say is that the, the chapter uh, was part of some kind of passionate release for me. I spent 38 years working in Rotherham, uh, and Rotherham over that time had been several different places. When I first started there, it was about coal, it was about steel, and, and parents were working three shifts a day and so forth. Then we got the steel strike, then we got the coal strike, uh, Rotherham became decimated, um, it was down on its knees totally, and then I suppose we started to get uh, call centres appearing uh, and, and as, as the mines were, were, were the, the steel works in the mines, were, it was so they were flattened overnight, there was, there was no chance of recovery. Uh, and it took the town down on its knees. Since then, there's been a, a rise in, in Eastern European uh, people moving into the town uh, uh, as well. Uh, and, and they bring many, many advantages. But uh, do you know what? For 38 years, I never, ever wanted to work anywhere else. I started as a probationary teacher in Old Money. I went right through to be assistant head of school effectiveness. Uh, I loved it. And then around 2014, uh, the J report came out, uh, child sexual exploitation in Rotherham. Now, some people might find this difficult to believe. I had been a senior officer in Rotherham Borough Council and I knew nothing about what had been going on. I was too busy chasing level fours in old money uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to know what was going on. Uh, Rotherman had a, a, a kind of record of creativity laid down by Sir Alec Clegg, the former uh, Chief Education Officer of, of the West Riding and so forth. But suddenly the whole spirit of the town went. Uh, and so yes, I, I went back to three town centre schools uh, that I had had acquaintances with in, in the past. I suppose the most moving one was the visit to Thornhill Primary School, a, a wonderful school, half a mile from the town centre, where you had actually got, first of all, the fir fir first thing I noticed as I walked into the school uh, was uh, some female Muslim parents playing volleyball in the school hall. Uh, and I thought, now that's unusual. Uh, but the head welcomed me, it's nothing to see after all. And she said, would you like a cup of tea? But I never got the cup of tea because she, she was dragging me around the school. But one of the most pertinent bits was you had got children from the families of victims of child sexual exploitation sat side by side with the families of the perpetrators of child sexual exploitation. Now the television cameras had long gone by this point and the school had got to pick up this tab. And, and it was done largely through 
a community banner. The children were doing things together as part of the community. And one of the best bits for me was uh, when uh, the, the school cricket team won this Yorkshire wide trophy. And by Jove, they take the cricket seriously in Yorkshire, if you, if you, if you, if you just if you, you should need to know that. But the way in which it worked with community, and, and then there was another school, Ferrum Primary School, where you'd got children from with 22 different languages behind them, if you like, playing in a brass band. Uh, yeah, what, what is, is more Yorkshire than that? Uh, and, and somehow they say, oh, they, they don't integrate and, and, and things like that. Uh, and community was uh, such, such a, a significant part. I've always felt one of the problems with national, a national curriculum is it can bleed a sense of um, local identity out of a community. Children don't understand the heritage from which they come. And, and, and I think that is so significant. Beth uh, raised a really significant point of thought about uh, the children going, out, and I've seen more families walking outdoors uh, and, and seeing things. There is a message there about actually outdoor education as well in vulnerable communities. Um, there's a much lost uh, report from Ofsted on, on the power of outdoor education. Um, and uh, it tells you that, that you know, children with special needs and children in vulnerable communities will benefit from learning outdoors. Uh, get the children out about, get them looking at the evidence of their historical past, the nature, the wildlife and, and so forth within it. Um, I remember, Beth told a story about her geography lessons. But I remember once when I had this proper job of having to go and observe a lesson relating to a project called Through the Classroom Window. And I remember saying, to, trying to find a subtle way of saying to the teacher, why not change it and go through the classroom door and out into the community rather than looking at it through, through, the, uh, uh, through, the, through the classroom window. Um, one of the things about community, uh, and if I can go back to the child sexual exploitation stuff, after it all hit the press, um, but, um, uh, I'm going to say, I was trying to say the National Front, uh, uh, BNP, I've got that right, BNP. Uh, they, do, they organised 14 different marches through Rotherham, uh, protesting about multiculturalism, uh, about, about everything really. And they've got the, uh, the, the St. flag of St. George waving high and they, they, they brought a sense of hatred to the town. It cost a fortune to police it. People turned out to watch and by and large, turned their back on it as they moved near towards them. Uh, that's a sense of community, I think. Actually, we'll yeah. decide what's right for our community. You go back to where you came from, we don't want you here. Yeah, yeah, it's powerful, powerful to yeah. tap. If, if I get time I, I, to talk a bit more about outdoor learning, I'd love to tell you a little bit about a fabulous project going on in Cheshire, but I, I, I'll, you know, well, I'll, we'll, yeah, I'll, we'll, see, we'll see what we get to. We also had, um, one of these set, bearing in mind all these conversations that are going to have been recorded will be released hopefully next week. Uh, Juliet Robertson um, is our outdoor learning guru, wrote the book Dirty Teaching and Messy Maths in one of these conversations with Jane Hewitt, who's not a million miles away from you in Barnsley, uh, talking about the power of outdoor learning and, and how relevant and pertinent and useful it is now in a, at, at a time of um, social distancing. Beth, in terms of the community, what's, how's, how have the last few weeks been for you? How have you kept that sense of community going over these last few weeks? Um, so I've actually said, um, like I said before, that I, I feel our community is stronger than ever. And I feel that my connection with that community, uh, mainly in my Senko role, um, has, has become stronger than ever. Um, I, I mean, I, I ring my families three times a week. Um, I hear all sorts down the end of the phone when they don't want to talk to me. Um, but we keep going and we have a laugh about it, we have a joke about it. Um, and actually, I feel that I've been welcomed into some of these homes more than ever before. Um, and I've really, really seen and understood what they're going through. Um, for example, I didn't know before all of this which families had a laptop, which didn't, which had a tablet, which families could read, um, which parents could write, um, and how we're going to address these barriers and how the grown up feels about that. I mean, they've not told me they can't read and write. Was that for a reason? Because now I know it and how am I going to deal with that um, in a way that's sensitive to them and to their child. Um, but I feel 
through all of this, actually, my relationships with the community um, are even stronger. Um, and I set a, a challenge for, um, or I set it across school last week, um, with it being Mental Health Awareness Week, um, I set them a challenge. So they had to create, um, design a kindness stone, so with a kind message on, because um, that was the theme of, of Mental Health Awareness Week. And then they were going to plant them around um, different parts of the community. Um, and then the idea is that then obviously you can go on your walk and you can spot them and read a nice message. Um, or you can even reply. So if, if, you, if you wanted to put a reply next to it. Um, and again, to kind of draw that sense of community, pull them together um, and show them, look, we're in this together. And I think that's one of the biggest things. And I've, I've shown them what I've done and I've made one and I'm going to go and put it in the community when I'm next in school because um, I feel like I'm part of that too. Um, and that came that came about actually um, because of some of the conversations that I was having. And I think again, there's a message in all of this that sometimes when we're in school, we're, we're so busy. And for me as a senko, I, I've got paperwork coming out of my ears. Do we actually sit and listen to them? Because there's so much that I've got from that because I can't sit and do the paperwork. So I've had to go on the phone and speak to them and listen to them. Um, and there was one conversation that I was having um, with numerous families, actually, not just one, about um, children saying that they've not got any friends. Um, so the children saying, I'm becoming increasingly distressed, saying, I've got no friends, I've got no friends. And their parents trying to say to them, look, you have, you have got friends, you're just not at school, so you're not seeing them, but you have got friends. But particularly for um, special needs children, but not just special needs children, actually. Vulnerable children who may have missed certain milestones as they grew up um, have, have missed this understanding. And so, um, like I say, a lot of distressed children um, crying, not able to get on with their day. A few of them not wanting to even go outside anymore, refusing to go outside. And I was thinking, how, how do we get around this? How do we show them that they have got friends? And that's when I was talking to you, Ian, about um, the object permanence of friendship. And I've written um, the blog around that um, because actually they've missed a part of their development that says, no, just because you can't see your friends, they're still there. It's, it's understanding that they still exist. And that's where the kindness stones start to come in um, because I, I just thought it'll give them something to show them, a physical object that shows them that people are still there. You can't see them, but that, that physical object, object is representing their presence. Um, and it, it's been really, really successful actually. Um, and then that's gone on to, um, for some of those, I mean, yesterday I was in school and I've got two children. One of them has been saying again, she's got no friends, she's, she's so distressed. Um, even kind of resorting back to thinking about her, her dog that they lost when about three years ago, but she's trying to understand all of this. Why can't I see these things happening? Um, so yesterday I was speaking to um, a child and we said, should we, should we write a note? So one of the children has written a note and a picture um, saying, I am your friend. What have you been doing? Um, and then we're posting it today and then she's going to do a response back and then we'll, we'll bring it back to him next week. And it's kind of just trying to think of ways to make sure that the presence of the community, the presence of those friendships do continue, um, even in a challenging time, because actually it's shown that it can make us stronger than ever, um, yeah. and especially for the vulnerable ones. When you say post it, do you mean post it online, post it, or post it as in, in the post with a stamp on post it? Well, we've, we've delivered it at the minute. Um, someone's gone and socially distanced, put it over the fence. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. Thank you for that. I love the little stone, the kindness stones, and you go out to your. your it, it, it's still the school community. It's just a little bit more dispersed, and that's. I mean, the, one of the questions is about the dispersed that, uh, of a dispersed community. But there's a question from Zoe, which I want to put to Dave, with your leadership hat on, Dave, and also the fact, Dave, that you've got experience of working with uh, schools and education systems globally as well in your in your current role. Um, and so what's the best way to build community with 28 primary schools from various different types of demographic? So we've talked a lot about the community and community school, but also now we're in the world of, of maths, where they might be diverse schools and diversely, uh, geographically diverse as well. First thing I'd say is it is possible. 
it really is possible. But I get exactly why you asked the question because the fact you asked the question means you know the difficulties that are that are part of it. But to be honest, I wrote about this in this in the latest book on on transition because I looked at the different scenarios of how people work together. Now I agree totally with Will. We often focus on transition being just primary to secondary, but it's actually between primaries. It's much wider. It's between classrooms. It's between it's between home and 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 school. So thinking wider on transition. Transition is quite straightforward if you all agree where you're going. Um, it's a bit the same as if we all decided we'll go on holiday together. It would be a nice uh, extra addition to, to, to what we're doing now. The first thing we'd do was decide where we were going to go, because otherwise we'd never get there. You can't have successful transition unless you know exactly where you're going. Now, if you've got a lot of different demographics or other areas, your issue is going to be, Actually, it's no good if we all want to go to different places. We've got to find a common ground. And the, the most simple thing is the ethos and values. Now, values are not uh, demographic-ridden. The, the values of great communities that are incredibly poor and great communities that are very rich are often very similar. Because values of what, what is it that you are absolutely about? What is it that drives why do you get up in the morning? What is it that drives why you've got your schools? Now, you've got to find that. Now, I, I agree that's not easy, but I mean, con I'm at the moment everybody at ITL because we've had to furlough our office staff. So any number you contact, ring or email to ITL will come to me at the moment. So if, if the person asking the question wants to discuss it a bit more, I'd be delighted to chat with you. But there are a number of techniques you could try to start that process. And if you could find three words, three values that you could agree, yeah, we might all be different, but we all agree this is what we'll do. And you then start acting them, I guarantee you, it will pull you together. It just does. It's, it's the magic of three, of three values that are not just on the wall because we think Ofsted are like them, but on the wall because that's what we believe. Right. That's our utter driver. Now, if you can have agreement on that, you will pull everybody together. It takes time. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen overnight because the second part of values is you have, people have to trust that they're true. And initially people will all be skeptical. But if you actually do every decision and everything you do based around the values you've agreed, you will build a trust and you build a way forward. And that's how you build those bridges. And that's what makes great transition. And that's what you need between infant, junior, secondary, tertiary, university, community, the lot, is that agreed, agreed values, you will get a smoother journey. Because right. you all go, this is how we're doing it. Zoe says, thank you, smiley face. Um, one more question uh, for you, Dave, and, and the blackbird that you've got with you. Um, I, uh, Close the door. <laughs> I wonder what the thought, Miriam's saying, what, I wonder what thoughts of the panel have for building community outside of school for cohorts that are spread over quite a large geographical area. So we're in a position, uh, you know, children coming into school by taxi, a lot of them. How do you, how, it's, it's one exactly, school. It's exactly the same. It's just taken, I, some of the best um, school communities I know are some of the, there's a beautiful one in the, in Cornwall that I've done some work with. It's a long trip to get down there. I was, I was hoping to go down there again this year. Um, and they've got some on the Cilia, part of it is on the Cilia Isles. They have to fly to, to get there. Yet they're getting an agreed sense of why they work together. And this is primary and secondary, and it's about, it's values driven. I've done some work with them uh, around there. They've got their own learning hubs. They're swapping lessons. They're, they're realizing everyone's different and that's that people get confused i think some very bad models of multiple academy some very good models of multi academy trusts and things have, have come but some very bad ones have come and the, for me the bad ones are where every school has to be the same because every school is not the whole point is every school is a beautiful gem on its own we can have the same values but we can't be the same place now just because you happen to be 500 miles apart actually doesn't stop it and I think particularly the new skills we're learning through zoom and everything else means that more potential to really make schools with the same values work 
across huge areas and I, I that's one of the things i'm really excited about as people suddenly realize that it is possible to collaborate even though you can't actually physically easily get to each other thank you that makes sense so much of it can we speak a few times this week so much of it coming back to values we need to get them right what we see at the moment with the our current government in the uk the values between loyalty and integrity and, and, and the battle that's going on between organisational values and personal values, it's, it's really interesting to, to, to watch. It would be nice if it wasn't real. Um, Beth, the, coming back, what, what is on your school's agenda or you personally in the agenda? What, what are the first few things? Because there's so much pressure coming from on high about closing the gap and catching up um, behaviour. Uh, this idea that children from poorer backgrounds, uh, you know, the, the research that showed they were spending less time at the computer, they didn't say what they were doing instead, but the implication coming was uh, the poorer kids have just been running feral and their parents aren't going to help them learn anyway. So it's the poor, and that's one of the reasons they're, they're trying to leave or open the schools in England, not in Wales and Scotland, they're taking their time. But it's, it's, it's because we need to close that gap. And, and, and they're specifically talking about the sorts of communities that you serve. What's, what is your, are you listening to that? Are you going to get them in and close that gap? Or are you going to do other things? What's your going back plan? Um, I, think, I, I think it's difficult because um, one of the things that I believe and that I've done a lot of research around um, is about personalising learning. Um, so actually, I don't know where this come from, comes from that all vulnerable children aren't doing this and all vulnerable children aren't doing that because actually I'm working with some families that are doing everything going above and beyond and they are classed as vulnerable in numerous ways um, so I think it's quite a, a broad thing to say that vulnerable children aren't, aren't doing what they've been asked and they're not learning because actually um, some of these vulnerable children and some of the children, for example, on SEN support, EHCs, as well as um, children um, with safeguarding um, concerns are actually coming into their own right now. And some of the things that I've seen from these children shows that. Um, so I've kind of, I've been thinking about it. I've kind of got two strands to, to, to return into school. And I think the first thing before any of this is, um, we're not going to jam pack our day by trying to get on with the curriculum and trying to fill it with this, this and this because they've missed that and I'm really worried about that. That's that's not how it's it's going to go. We're going to we're going to take take them where they are. So we're going to listen to them. They're going to come in and they're going to bring what they've got. They're going to bring their experiences and um, they're going to bring their their life skills that they've learned um, and we're going to take them where they are um, and then we're going to personalise it. Um, and then we're going to work with them, and then we're going to work with the communities. And actually, I, th I think we've we've got um, a real kind of bonus to this because I know, for example, in my classroom, I'm going to be getting eight children back at one time. That's eight children. I'm used to working with a class of thirty. I've got eight children that I can really, really work with and unpick and find out what they're interested in and find out what they've learned and find out what they have or haven't done. And then I can work with that. So first thing, I think we've just got to listen and um, we've got to plan in time to listen and we've got to take the children where they are and as they come. Um, the two strands that, I was, that, that then that leads me on to is that we're going to have some children that vulnerable or not vulnerable um, have loved this time and um, they probably weren't that bothered about school to begin with and now they've loved this time it's been sunny they've been able to learn outside they've been able to uh, play with big brother they've been able to do their learning when they want they can sit where they want and um, they can use the computer which is a massive hook for some children and um, they can use a tablet there's games um, and you've got those children that didn't really like school before and now they've found out that they really love being at home. So you've got a challenge. You've also got the other side of it, um, that is the children that love school and are dying to get back into school. And I kind of drew it onto a diagram and there's these children and this group of children. And then I thought about what next for each group? How are we gonna pull that back together uh, to build that trust and reestablish those, those relationships and get them motivated because in our school, we've worked so hard on building this curriculum that the children love, building a school that they love, and, and we don't want to lose that at this point. And I think 
we would be on a very fine line of balance in terms of we could be about to lose all of that if we don't go about this really carefully mm. so for both groups I, and it just led me to the same question why so why are these children not wanting to come back and why are these children wanting to come back um and then we pull in from there so what what have they got from being at home what have they loved about being at home that we can recreate here because then surely they're going to love being here because they've got those things that they love about being at home and they've got their friends and they've got teachers that are going to motivate and inspire and then we've got these children that love being in school anyway and maybe they'll even love seeing what they're doing and want to do a bit of that as well um so that's kind of the the, the thing to think about i think is yeah. what you've got from each side and how you're going to approach it yeah. but um, a lot of that i think comes back to um kind of your, your curriculum and interspersing it with the things that your children need so yeah I, I don't want to spend all day talking about kind of the negative experiences and making it a negative thing if they want to talk about that we can talk about that but it's understanding the emotion of being back and um, how we're going to deal with it what do we love about it how can we make it what we love um and then and then going from there um, but I, I mean, for me, I've brought lo I've bought loads of different storybooks um, about friendship, about change, and um, and that sort of thing that are, that are there, and they're, they're kind of less intimidating ways of kind of talking through it, um, getting them to talk, um, and then kind of going from there. Where do we need to go next? Lovely. Um, in terms of transition, and let's let's do the the old fashioned version of transition, which is what's how are you, as a school, I know you're year one, but as a school, how are you preparing your year sixes to transition to whichever uh, secondary school they're going to? Is there, is there anything specific you've got in plan for them? Um, for our year sixes at the minute, it's, it's, it's a bit um, unclear at the minute because we are delaying their, their restart. So we're getting reception year one settled first and then year six are going to come after. Um, but I've been speaking to um, our, our secondary school because we're in a trust with our secondary school um, and we are wanting to do something where somehow they need to connect with that. Um, I know our secondary school for some of our EHC children have been um, taking over say one of my EHC phone calls a week and having that check in with them um, just to start building on what I've been doing and um, they've also been kind of setting some of our um, an more anxious children um, sort of a what they're calling a year seven task um, so that they can get them feeling like they're able to do this and it's not going to be as daunting and start building on some of that um, is what we've done so far um, but again it's all a bit we're not sure kind of um, how year six are coming back yeah. but we're linking with still so much up in the air. Dave, we've, we've got three minutes to go, so quite quickly, Dave, what would be your, uh, um, if, if you were uh, uh, the, still running the all through, so no, if you were the secondary head, how would you be instructing your uh, transition teachers to, to operate over the next few weeks very quickly? Yeah, I, I, I would say get in touch with the, the primaries, M make sure you're building that relationship because more than ever, it, it, it great transition is great relationship and that's utterly where we go wrong great transition is not data it is not you know they are just tiny parts of it so the relationships has to be key i would be looking to try and do zoom classes to talk to reassure the kind of thing that beth's talking about and lots more because transition should be from reception till you leave school in fact till you're an adult it's lifelong learning by an old-fashioned name and that actually is what we should be thinking. So think like that and you'll be fine. And give me a, give me a call and I'd be delighted to talk through what I think would, would help you. But please don't just think of it, oh, we've got the data and we'll test them the first week. Don't do that. <laughs> OK, thank you, Dave. Um, uh, Will, uh, you've got a minute. Would you like the last word on this? What, what? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about uh, an exciting project. Year six has uh, returned to school, a school in Cheshire, which I've visited a couple of times. Absolutely fabulous. They spent the last few weeks with the children who've been in school largely outdoors. These children have climbed trees, they've built tree houses, they've studied tadpoles, they've watched a blue tit lay its eggs and, and the eggs come to life and so forth. They've, they've built uh, 
trolleys and, 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 and go-karts and designed them and raced. And you know what? They've decided they don't want to go back to the old norm. So when their year six has arrived, uh, they've hit upon this idea of each week a quest will be delivered to them, which will be, which will be done, carried out largely outdoors. The quest might be, can you design a nature trail around the school grounds with five stopping points? Can you use a part of the grounds to create an exciting story setting? But each week the quest is, is delivered by somebody else. Uh, and, and that brings in a point, another point from Jonathan this morning, because it, the quest is delivered by somebody, it brings in that cr critical audience uh, for the end of the week. Uh, and a very, very wise man uh, this morning, uh, I think he was called Ian Gilbert, said, we can't afford to waste a good chaos like this. <laughs> Let's think about what we're going to do when these children come back. Let's try and create a, a new and exciting future for, in some of our schools. Right. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Beth. Good luck going back, Beth. You're right at the sharp end. Good luck. Stay safe. Uh, thank you, Will. So I, 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 whenever I see you, whenever I get a chance to see the three of you, I'll buy you a, a pint, gin and tonic, Prosecco, whatever is your, your thing. Thank you, everybody who's, who's been attending, been involved in the chat. Um, if you want to carry on the chat at ITL Worldwide, we're on Twitter. Uh, email me, I think Lynn's put it up in at internalthinking.co.uk. Happy to field any more questions wherever we can. Um, uh, if you want to check out independentthinking.com, you can find out more about Dave and Will. Independentthinkingpress.com are the books, Dave's books, all Will's books. They're 30% off. Uh, CPD30 is the code you need to check out. For the physical book, if you want the e-book, uh, it's now 50% off VAT 50. The government knocked 50% and knocked the VAT off e-books, which means we can pass that on. So, um, but those codes only work with independentthinkingpress.com. If you go to Amazon, you pay more and we get less tax. And the NHS needs all the tax it can get at the moment. Um, this will go on to YouTube all being well next week, as will all the other uh, conversations that we're having. There's still a bit of space left on the ones that are left, so check out our, our, our website for the links. Um, uh, the bereavement one coming up in, uh, I don't know, half five, your time, I think, um, it, it is a must. It, uh, sadly, is, is a must. And then a few more tomorrow, including one tomorrow afternoon with Dave, where he comes back with a different hat on and probably a different tie where we're looking at wonder and, and curiosity. But that's it. That's the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe and I'll see you very soon. Bye.